Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Quick and this is our playlist for explanations to our high yield USMLE Step 1 question bank. Today we'll be going over GI questions. If you want to try these questions out on your own before going over it together, I will leave a link in the description. For those of you here for explanations, let's just jump on into it. As we usually do for these videos, I will go through the first question with you using our method just to get you into the habit and then we will let you try some out on your own. Okay, so for the first question, let's just begin reading where I bolded and discuss. He appears to have some abdominal distension and is in general distress. Upon rectal examination, a sudden release of fecal matter from the rectal vault occurred. Which of the following is most likely? A. Maternal use of cocaine. B. Advanced paternal age. C. Inadequate folate reductase activity. D. Failure of neural crest cell migration. Or E. Primigravid status. So from what the question stem gave us, we are already able to figure out the most probable diagnosis for this patient. Specifically the part where it says sudden release of fecal matter from the rectal vault. What is this sign called? Hopefully you know what this sign is called, squirt sign, right? And that is hallmark for what disease or what condition. And hopefully you're saying to me Hirschsprung's disease, right? Hirschsprung's disease. So already we were able to get the most probable diagnosis just from the question stem alone. And now we have to check, do we have any answers to back this up? You should be saying choice D, a failure of neural crest cell migration. Remember, Hirschsprung's is due to a failure of neural cell derived ganglion cell migration to parts of the colon specifically to our back and Meisner's plexus. These ganglion cells are inhibitory in nature, so if you lack them, the affected segment of the large bowel is going to be tonically contracted, not allowing for stool to pass. On imaging, you will see a narrow distal portion, which is the affected portion that lacks the ganglion cells, and a dilated proximal portion that is normal bowel, where the stool has been building up as it is unable to pass through the affected portion that is more distal. Now, if we wanted to, we can read the rest of the question to see if it is indeed discussing our suspicion. So. After a routine pregnancy, a primigravid mother at 38 weeks gestation gives birth to an 11 pounds 8 ounce male. A few days later, the mother returns to the clinic with her newborn. This is consistent with what we originally thought as Hirschsprung's, which typically presents with a failure to pass first meconium after birth. Now, there is an adolescent variant as well, but that is not high yield for step 1 or level 1 exams. Okay, so let's move on to question 2. And instead of bolding for you, I want you to pause the video and try to do the method on your own and arrive at a tentative answer, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so hopefully you got your answer. Now I'm going to read the question. A four-month-old boy is brought to the clinic by his mother after she notices her baby has difficulty with bowel movements and was unsure if this was normal since this was her first time being a mom. Of note, the child has been known to sometimes cry during bowel movements. No bilious vomiting is seen. Which of the following is most likely? A. A blind duodenal pouch, B, lack of relaxation in the rectal vault, C, ectopy of the gastric tissue, D, malrotation of bowel, or E, failure of pancreatic bud effusion. So we made this question intentionally ambiguous to get you to start thinking of most likely causes. If you do not know where to begin, you always want to try and form a differential based on the signs and symptoms. However, if nothing still comes to mind, you may need to look at the answer choices in order to start focusing in on particular diagnoses. So let's go through each of the answer choices. A, a blind duodenal pouch. So that's a description for duodenal atresia. Most often with duodenal atresia, it presents immediately after birth, not months afterwards, and you most often do see bilious vomiting, which is not seen in this patient. So we can rest assured that A is probably not going to be their answer choice. How about lack of relaxation in the rectal vault? Well, we actually just covered this in the previous question, which we talked about Hirschsprung's disease, right? So that is hallmark for Hirschsprung's disease. We talked about how that presents with a failure to pass first meconium immediately after birth, so although this child seems to be having a problem with bowel movements, he is probably too old for Hirschsprung's. How about choice C, ectopy of gastric tissue? Well, this is a description for Meckel diverticulum, which is a true diverticulum or outpouching of all three layers of the bowel. If you remember the rule of twos for Meckel's diverticulum, one of them is that it affects children under two years old. So this child does fall into that age group, now, Meckel's is classically described as an anti-mesenteric diverticulum that can cause painless blood in the stool in the form of hematochesia, since it is past the ligament of trites. We do not have a description of the stool itself, but we do know that the infant cries when having a bowel movement, which implies pain and discomfort. Now, although Meckel's can present as painless by itself, it is also the most common lead point for intussusception or telescoping of the proximal bowel into the distal bowel. This would indeed cause pain and difficulty with bowel movements, so hopefully you agree with me in saying that we cannot rule this choice out quite yet. Okay, let's evaluate the remaining choices. How about D, malrotation of the bowel? 
Well, in malrotation of the bowel, you have a form of obstruction that can result in a volvulus, which, if untreated, can be lethal. It is characterized as an emergency due to this outcome, and it usually presents with frank blood in the stool, pain, and bilious vomiting. However, the last sentence where it says that there is no bilious vomiting makes this condition less likely than Beckel's. And finally, we have choice E, failure of pancreatic bud fusion, which results in pancreatic divisum, where you have two separate buds that drain into two different tracts. This can result in abdominal pain from pancreatitis later on in life. Aside from the timing component, the symptoms that we see are not consistent with pancreatitis, which would be extreme abdominal pain that radiates to the back with nausea, vomiting, fever, rapid pulse, etc. So the most probable answer in this case is intussusception secondary to Meckel D reticulum, which is answer choice C. All right, let's try question three. I want you to pause me and try to do the method on your own again. So hopefully you have your answer. I will read this quickly and we will talk about it. A 28-year-old male presents to the office with complaints of excessive gas and diarrhea following his meals. He used to eat a vegan diet, but has stopped as of two weeks ago since his corporate job requires long hours and no time for lunch. The episodes of gas have been increasing in frequency over the past two weeks and the diarrhea was noted as of last week. He usually eats whatever the office caters for him, which has been fast food items such as pizza. Where is the defect most likely to be found? A. Pancreatic acinus. B. Villi of the small intestine. C. Auerbach's plexus. D. Sphincter of Odi. Or E. Rugae of the stomach. So, what do we know about this patient's condition? Whenever you see anything involving bloating, gas, diarrhea, you always want to see if it's related to meals. That should be your first step. If it is, then you would need to check what type of food that is triggering the condition. This usually will either give you the answer or, at the very least, an accurate diagnosis. In this patient's case, the symptoms appear linked to food, specifically pizza, which is wheat-based. So what condition is associated with wheat intolerance? Hopefully you're saying celiac disease. Okay, so now they're asking for where specifically in the GI tract does celiac disease affect? In other words, you've probably seen histological sections of celiac before. It just wants you to remember where that section is taken and or what it looks like. So I'll give you a second to just think about it. And hopefully you recall that celiac causes a blunting of the villi of the small intestine, right? They love that term, blunting of the villi. So that would be answer choice B. It does not directly affect the other locations that are in the answer choices. All right, let's try the next question. Do the same thing again. I want you to pause and try it for yourself. Okay, so hopefully you settled on an answer. Let's read it really quickly. 48-year-old man presents to the emergency room after a motor vehicle accident. He had finished a 36-hour shift and was driving home when he was found by EMS after colliding with a tree. Penetrating trauma from the accident was noted somewhere on his back, and he was transported to the ER. His vitals upon admission were 97.1 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 heart rate, 16 respirations per minute, and a blood pressure of 95 over 58. When asked by the ER physician about potential blood loss, the EMS crew reported difficulty in log rolling the patient due to suspected cervical spine fracture, but that his upper back had definitely avoided the penetrating trauma. Where is the bleed most likely to be found? A. Hepatic flexure of the ascending colon. B. Tail of the pancreas. C. Distal one-third of the duodenum. D. Splenic capsule. Or E. Suprarenal glands, also known as the adrenal glands. All right, so we have a trauma patient, right? We have a penetrating trauma patient, actually that is limited to his mid or lower back. He is hemodynamically compromised, which is evidenced by low blood pressure with either compensated tachycardia or decompensated cardiac output. Now, if you don't know where to start, hopefully you're looking at the answer choices where you can see what category each of them falls into and what the relation between all of them are. Specifically, this question is testing retroperitoneal versus intraperitoneal bleeding and the most common causes of both. So one way to evaluate if there's retroperitoneal bleeding is to look for gray turner or cullen sign. So gray turner sign is ecchymosis on each flank. The way I remember it is that it's two words, right? Gray hyphen turner, then you have two flanks. And the cullen sign is a periumbilical ecchymosis, and both of them are signs of retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So the things that cause retroperitoneal bleeding will most likely produce those patterns of ecchymosis. Since this patient does not have those signs, it makes a retroperitoneal bleed less likely. So, how are you supposed to remember all of the retroperitoneal organs? I have always used the mnemonic SAD pucker. I'll put the mnemonic up on your screen for you. So S is for suprarenal, also known as the adrenal glands. A for the aorta, you want to kind of link it with IVC or inferior vena cava. 
D for duodenum, except the proximal segment, P for pancreas, except the tail, U for ureters, C for colon, both the ascending and the descending parts, K for kidneys, E for esophagus, and R for rectum. Those are all retroperitoneal, and thus if there is a rupture or damage to any of those parts, you can suspect a retroperitoneal bleed. In this case, all the answer choices listed are retroperitoneal except the tail of the pancreas and the splenic capsule, which are both intraperitoneal. Between both of these, if you just play odds, which you should always try to do on these exams with general questions, traumatic damage with hemodynamic compromise is usually due to splenic damage. That's because it holds a lot of the red blood cells in. This question was purposely very vague in order to try and get you to evaluate each answer choice and see which is more likely. Even though it may be different in real life, whenever you see a traumatic abdominal injury with a falling blood pressure, you want to immediately think possible splenic laceration, liver laceration, or duodenal hematoma, and then rule out from there. That should carry you through a majority of abdominal trauma-related questions. Okay, if you were able to get that, good job, that was really tough. Let's try a question that actually requires some thinking and recognition rather than just regurgitating the most common cause. So let's read this one together. A 47-year-old woman presents to the clinic with complaints of itchy skin. She recently noted darkening of her urine over the past few months along with periodic right upper quadrant pain. Current medications include lisinopril and levothyroxine for her diabetes and hypothyroidism respectively. A biopsy of her bile duct is shown below. Which of the following is most likely? A, antineutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, ANCA. B, non-casein and granulomas, C, hepatorenal syndrome, D, cholelithiasis, or E, hepatitis C. So what do we know about this patient? Well, she's a middle-aged woman who has pruritus, right, itchiness of the skin. Her urine is dark. She has right upper quadrant pain. And we are given her medication list for her past medical history. We are also given this histological image of her bile duct. And in most questions, when they show you a histological image, if you are able to identify unique features about it, you will most likely arrive at the correct diagnosis even without the rest of the question. In this case, let's just go through everything together and be extra thorough. Whenever you see pruritus, you should be thinking of something involving either the liver, a rash, neurosensory changes, or polycythemia vera rubrum. Now, it would be no surprise to you that this might have something to do with the liver because all the answer choices have something to do with the liver. Since we are seeing a darkening of the urine, we know it is either an intrahepatic or posthepatic cause, since both can cause an increase in conjugated bilirubin, which will subsequently end up in the urine and darkens it. So let's go through the answer choices now and see if we can eliminate any of them. So A, ANCA. Okay, which liver condition is associated with an ANCA antibody? Hopefully you were saying primary sclerosing cholangitis, right, PSC. Could we rule this out from the information provided above? Well, not really, since it can cause a cholestatic liver presentation, much like the one presented in the question. Although it should be noted that out of both primary sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cholangitis, PBC, the latter one, is more traditionally associated with pruritus. But I've seen it presented both ways in multiple question banks, so you can't just rely on that. How about choice B, non-caseating granulomas? With which liver condition is this associated? Hopefully you are saying primary biliary cholangitis, which presents similar to this patient's condition, so it cannot be ruled out either. Can we rule out choice C, hepatorenal syndrome? Hopefully you are saying yes, since we don't see any sort of kidney-related issues here. How about choice D, cholelithiasis? We would expect self-limiting episodes of colicky right upper quadrant pain triggered by fatty or heavy foods, possibly radiating to the right shoulder. This patient does have risk factors for cholelithiasis, such as being a middle-aged female, but this patient has been experiencing these symptoms for months, which goes against the episodic nature of pure cholelithiasis. Further, histological imaging would be relatively unremarkable. So choice D is very unlikely. How about hepatitis C or choice E? Well, this would cause an intrahepatic jaundice, which can elevate the conjugated bilirubin and darken the urine, but this patient has no risk factors for hepatitis C. So that will be lower on the differential, Technically, you can't really rule it out quite yet, but it's lower than PBC and PSC, as we previously discussed. So we can pretty much say it is between choices A and B as the most likely, and now we have to decide which condition this patient has. So this is where the histological image will come in handy. It is not enough to know that pruritus is more commonly associated with primary biliary cholangitis rather than PSC, since both of them can present with it. The histological image shows cellular infiltrate in circular shapes, which is hallmark for Hopefully you're saying granulomas, right, granuloma formation. As we've said before, non-casein granulomas in the biliary tree, specifically the small intrahepatic bile ducts, 
is hallmarked for PBC, while fibrosis of the larger bile ducts would indicate PSC. So in this case, the answer would be B, non-caseating granulomas. Right, and that's because it's PBC. So a cholestatic liver presentation with pruritus, darkening urine, you could have pain. You're going to see small intrahepatic bile ducts being affected, and you'll see non-caseating granulomas on histological sections. All right, great job. Let's try the next question together. This is our second to last question together, so if you need to get up and stretch, please be my guest. Feel free to pause me in the meantime. Okay, and for those of you who just want to move on, I want you to do the same thing we just did in the previous question on your own. Make sure you use the image as a means to confirm the diagnosis and then use that to answer the question. I will give you a few seconds to pause me and try it out before we continue together. Okay, and hopefully you were able to arrive confidently at some answer. Let's read it together. A 62-year-old male was admitted from the emergency room for nausea, abdominal pain, and vomiting. Lipase and amylase levels are normal. The patient has had multiple similar episodes in the past, but states that it has never been this bad. Imaging is performed and the results are shown on the right. The patient is educated on his condition, learning that he is at an increased risk for a particular type of cancer. What is part of the pathophysiology of this patient's condition? A. Metastatic calcification. B. Dystrophic calcification. C. Ulcer formation. D. Pancreatic obstruction. Or E. A viral infection. So a lot of things can cause nausea, abdominal pain, and vomiting. These aren't very specific signs for anything in particular. The lipase and amylase levels are normal, which indicates that it is most likely not acute pancreatitis. Since this is a pretty general presentation, we will have to rely on the radiograph. So what do we see on the radiograph? Hopefully you see that little circular calcification in the top left of the image, where the gallbladder is supposed to be. When you see a white ring like that on x-ray, you should be thinking about some sort of calcification, always. This presentation is most consistent with the porcelain gallbladder, which puts you at a higher risk for gallbladder cancers. So now the question becomes, what kind of calcification is this? Hopefully you were saying choice B, right? Dystrophic calcification. Dystrophic calcifications result from tissues being damaged or dying, which promotes calcium accumulation. So if you want to review this topic, you can watch Pathoma, chapters 1 and 2, and that usually covers uh, dystrophic calcifications and, and the process of cellular breakdown and damage along with inflammation pretty well. In this case, the patient has had a blockage of the gallbladder, which causes inflammation of the wall, leading to ischemia and cellular damage. So I want you to juxtapose this with metastatic calcification, which involves multiple organs secondary to high serum calcium levels. So once again, this answer is going to be choice B, dystrophic calcification. All right, let's check out our final question. We'll read this one together since it's very short. An 81-year-old woman complains of heartburn and a dry cough. She has been taking cimetidine with mild relief. What is the mechanism of action for cimetidine? Does it bind to an M3 receptor? Does it bind to a CCKB receptor? Does it inhibit GS signaling cascade? Does it inhibit the GQ signaling cascade? Or does it bind to receptors on chief cells? So I'll give you a few seconds to recall this. And uh, I want you to remember that you are responsible for knowing signaling cascades and second messenger molecules right, for most hormones and medications. Okay, and hopefully you have chose answer choice C. Cimetidine inhibits GS signaling on parietal cells as it is an H2 blocker. Right? And H2, uh, if it's activated, it would cause signaling through the GS cascade, but because cimetidine is a blocker, it's actually inhibiting GS signaling. Well, that's it for this question set. Please feel free to check out our other videos and explanations, and I will see you in the next video.